Hi everybody and welcome to another piano review here on the Miriam Pianos YouTube channel. My name is Stu Harrison. Today we're looking at Roland's LX706. This is the middle child of their LX line. Sits above the 705, below the 708. What is it all about? And what does it have to offer that is unique within that line? We're going to try and answer those questions, give you a sense of its sound, talk about its features, discuss the action, and all of those things we usually love to cover here on the channel. If it's the first time that you're seeing us here on YouTube, thank you for stopping in so much. We really appreciate you visiting. Please hit that notification bell and the subscribe button so that we can see you again. We'd love to have you back. Without further ado, let's dive right in to the LX706 right away. The first time we took a look at Roland's most recent release of the LX line, we skipped over the LX706. Um, this wasn't so much uh, a statement against this particular model, so much as it was just an expression of what our customers were really telling us, which is this is kind of a weird middle child of the LX line. You've got the 705, 706, and 708. And the price difference between the 706 and 708 at that time really wasn't that significant. And so what everyone was basically saying is, well, if you're going to go up to the 706, why not just go all the way to the 708? Because instead of having six speakers, you go up to the eight speakers. Some people really appreciated the slightly taller cabinet that the LX708 was giving, the slightly beefier amplifiers that the 708 was giving. Uh, and so for a relatively modest increase in price, they really just saw a tremendously higher value with the LX708. And you know, I kind of agreed with them. And so the 706 got a bit of a pass the first time around. The LX705, I really felt was a meaningful upgrade over the HP704. So, you know, that was another really strong value point. Well, we're now into 2022, and as everybody is well aware, we are living in a reality of extreme inflation pretty well anywhere in the world, uh, and we are experiencing price increase after price increase, and the LX708 has now gotten into a price range which takes it uh, almost into like baby grand territory in terms of its pricing. And so the LX706 now occupies what the LX708 was price-wise, when we first did these reviews. So I have a feeling that the LX706 is gonna become of substantial interest to customers who are still trying to keep their purchase uh, well underneath the $10,000 price point. Uh, you know, not sure what currency anybody is dealing with when they're watching these, but if we're talking about American dollars, uh, the LX706 uh, is gonna be considerably under that point. And so here we are at this fine instrument. Um, but the other really interesting thing about coming back to some of these instruments is that your perspective changes. It's constantly evolving. Um, you know, your likes and dislikes may remain the same, but the things that your ears are hearing, the things that your fingers are hearing, it's, it's much like if you're, um, you know, a scotch or a wine lover, um, your palate develops over time. And, and for me, I find that my ears develop over time. They're constantly uh, developing. I'm continuing to learn new things about pianos and digital pianos. And so when I come back to this, I just hear all sorts of different things or I'm appreciating or reflecting upon different things on this series than I did when we did the LX705 and 708. So we're gonna walk through the instrument, we're gonna play it, we're gonna to describe to you uh, its various features. Um, and as I always do, we'll talk about the action uh, and just share with you my thoughts on this instrument and hope that that is useful to you in your own journey to find an instrument that you really love to play. So before we do any more talking, let's just listen to this instrument. Uh, now this particular uh, sound engine uses its pure acoustic modeling. So when we're listening to acoustic piano tones on the 706, 708, there's a few other models within the Roland line, we are hearing the most recent version of their modeling engine. Now I get into this in great detail in many other videos. We'll briefly touch on it here. 
modeling is essentially the real-time rendering or the real-time creation of piano tone that does not depend on the playback of a sample. So this is a computer model that's been built with all of the various parameters taken into account. So uh, the striking of a string by a hammer, uh, the physics behind that, uh, the cabinet resonance, um, various modeling uh, to do or shaping to do with the soundboard, um, all of the extra sort of um, let's call it secondary tones that the piano produces, you know, mechanical sounds that the pedal's creating, all of those things are being generated real time based on what you are inputting into it. So uh, it really does give you a great degree of control. Um, I would say the biggest improvement that I have felt or sensed from the pure acoustic modeling has been the sense of uh, imperfection, which I say in a very positive thing. Um, you are starting to hear a little more grit in the instrument. You're starting to hear a little more variation out of the box from note to note, which is more consistent with what you'd actually get on a real piano. Uh, the previous version um, of the engine certainly allowed you to play around with a huge number of parameters and get pretty close to what I would think is uh, you know, a, an ideal sound, but out of the box it still sounded pretty perfect, almost kind of too perfect. Now this engine features two grand models and they never really specify what pianos they are using as their inspiration, um, but it says American Grand uh, and then it says European Grand and if you look at the photos that they use on their website when they're indicating American and European, it's a photo of New York and it's a photo of Hamburg. So I guess we're playing Steinways. Uh, the European Grand and American Grand uh, uh, delightfully have very different characters and we're going to listen to both of those right now um, and I will start with the European Grand because that is what they have as number one. Um, I've not modified the sound in any way and what you are hearing is direct uh, line outs for this instrument. Here we go. Now, the kind of depth and sustain you're getting on this definitely means that they are modeling a nine-foot piano. That's quite clear. Uh, let's now hear exactly the same thing on the American Grand, or at least as close as I can play. I don't know why I was inspired to do Sondheim. Maybe it was just the New York uh, thing, but for anyone who was uh, wanting to know or recognize it and couldn't quite place it, that is Sondheim's Send in the Clowns. And here it is on the American Grand.
what's interesting, between those two sounds, the American sound uh, coming through the speakers, um, and I'm hoping through the line out as well, um, is a, a, a slightly more open sound. It's actually sounding a, le a little less blended than the Hamburg. Uh, when we go over to the Hamburg, and I'm saying Hamburg, but on the display again, it says European. Um, Each note just has a bit more of a thickness to it. Um, it's more of a blended sound. Roland's really made some significant efforts to um, increase the dynamicism of the instrument. Uh, that, that is uh, the variation between loud and soft and your ability to really well control that. That was something that wasn't really known as, maybe not a weakness, but certainly not a strength in the Roland line if you go back um, 10 years, even five years ago. It was always something that Kawhi was incredibly strong. It was creating this very realistic uh, level of, of volume variation. Um, and now I think Roland is definitely uh, playing in the same league um, as, as Kawhi there. One of the advantages of having modeling is that everything is editable. Um, you know, if we, you thought that something like uh, harmonic imaging on a Kawhi or uh, Yamaha's, you know, editing capability on some of its CFX grand um, sound source engines uh, was great, uh, it's just nothing compared to what you get when you get into something like the Roland. It's very similar uh, to say Piano Tech as a VST. Literally everything is editable uh, and you get to it by pressing the Piano Designer key on uh, the front tab. And the nice thing is, is there's really three levels of editing that you can get to. So if you want to keep this nice and simple, they've got My Stage, um, which is really just a set of presets and they've given them names to imply what those sounds are going to be like or what the, the moods or vibes are going to be like. Um, and you've got this multi-function uh, knob that makes it very easy to navigate these menus. I, I really think Roland's done a good job of, of creating these menus. The, the user experience on the menus is great. So you get into soundstage and this is what you've got. So piano recital, to me that suggests you're going to be on kind of a medium stage. So maybe some extra ambience. So let's hear what it sounds like. It's actually a little drier than I thought that it would be. There's some ambience, but not too much. At hall stage, definitely more there. Lakeside Studio. Very dry.
uh, impressionist. So, uh, you know, I guess that's sort of going for something that's a little, uh, the, the reverb depth is, is greater, but the reverb time is a little less. Heritage Hall Lounge Concert. So anyway, there's 12 of these various things and it's a quick way to get through all of these different settings. Now, if that's not good enough for you, go one level deeper and you get into, uh, not my stage, but the next set of parameters, which we're gonna call, uh, I guess, tier two, or I'm calling them tier two parameters. So this is where you get ambience, uh, key touch, uh, brilliance, uh, master tuning, the temperament, uh, hammer response. Uh, so I guess there's what, six there? And then if you really want to go down the rabbit hole, uh, the tier three, which they call the piano tone edit. And this is, um, this gets intense. So this is where we get into single note character single note volume, single note tuning, soft pedal uh, uh, manipulation, damper noise, soundboard type, which is actually a really cool setting to play around with, cabinet resonance, key off resonance, full scale string resonance, duplex, hammer noise, key off noise, lid. Like I said, pretty much everything. Um, so a huge capacity to create your own piano tone. And what's nice is the second you get in there and start manipulating any of those settings, it cues you as to whether you wanna save it. Thank you for doing that because I can't tell the number of models and, and brands, and this stretches across all brands, nobody's exempt here, uh, where they give you the ability to edit, but then to actually save that setting either requires a deep dive into the manual or in worst case scenario, they don't even give you the option to do it criminal in my opinion. Anyway, this is great. It just cues you right away to have you save that setting. So it's easy to find as soon as you come back to it. Uh, and it becomes a very personal thing. You really, you know, you can set it for your room because all the rooms, uh, every room you set this in, is going to have a slightly different acoustics. You might want to get in there and actually get into individual um, note characters and tuning. There might be, you know, a particular window or a door or, you know, a type of floorboard that just resonates on one note. You want to, you know, dampen that a little bit. It's incredible that you can do that. Moving out of the acoustic piano experience, we leave the modeling and we get back into more conventional tone generation um, and still a very capable uh, I guess chipset or, or uh, you know, system architecture that delivers 384 notes worth of polyphony, which is more than ample, and there is uh, well over 300 sounds as well. So this now gets into some of the more conventional Roland sounds like the 1976 suitcase. <laughs> I think Roland's EPs overall are probably the best in the industry.
vintage EP, FM, so tons and tons of EPs that you can go through. The strings are quite lush. And lots of different strings to choose from as well. Uh, there's chamber winds. It's actually pretty convincing. Harp, violin. So you, you get some orchestral sounds. Um, and then you hit the pipe organs, uh, which again are incredibly well done. Tons and tons. And then you get into the general MIDI 2 sound set, which is why the total tone count on this instrument is so high. Uh, you do have the ability to set registration so that you have you know quick recall of a number of uh, those options which is great um, you also have several onboard features like playback of famous classical music uh, you can turn the parts on and off and there is an onboard recorder you can do all the basic stuff like split uh, dual, you can do the transpose, there is metronome, and there is uh, rhythm playback as well. So that pretty well covers what you're getting out of the user interface as well as the sound engine. We're going to take a very quick break and we're going to come back and talk about the action because the action on this one in the LX708 is, is noteworthy for a few reasons. It's not kind of just a footnote or, or a matter of just saying, oh, I like it or I don't like it. There's some cool stuff there. So stick with us and we'll be back in just a second. So the LX706 and LX708 use a Roland action called the Grand Hybrid Action. This is different than what goes on the GP607-609. It's different than the LX705, different than any of the HPs. In fact, it's the only two instruments Roland makes that puts these actions in it. And what makes it different than, say, the PHA50? Uh, well, this is a feature that virtually never gets talked about with any level of specificity inside the digital piano world and I don't really know why. Um, it has a huge effect on the sense of motion to a key. It, it has a huge effect on, on uh, the, I, I guess, just your impression of the action. And what we're talking about is pivot length. That is, what is the length of a white key between the very front surface and the point at which it pivots. So that's either going to be on the balance rail, like if it's on an acoustic piano, or if it's on a digital piano, it's right to wherever the back hinge is or the back pivot point is. Uh, and the logic goes is that the closer that pivot point is to that of a real piano, and usually a real grand piano is the reference point being used, uh, the closer the sense of motion and control is going to be to that of an acoustic piano. Makes sense. But these are all over the place. I mean, the, the level of variety uh, within the industry is enormous. Uh, the longest key to the shortest key in terms of pivot length is almost two to one. Um, and what's remarkable about the grand hybrid action on the Roland is that it clocks in at about 26 centimeters. Uh, and if you do some digging and some research and you get your tape measure out and you start to uh, uh, look at what the other instruments that uh, come in at about the same range, you're going to come up with instruments like a Kawai GX2. You're going to find that a Steinway B, their seven foot semi concert grand, I'm not sure if they call it a semi concert grand, salon grand, parlor grand, the B. Uh, comes in at 27 centimeters, so just a centimeter longer than that. You're going to find other really notable six-foot grand pianos coming in substantially under that, such as the Yamaha C3X. You're going to find other actions which are really, really well respected coming in several centimeters below that, such as uh, the Kawai RH3. Um, Kawai's newest uh, grand hybrid action that's going on like the CA99 
uh, gets very, very close to the 26 centimeter mark, but it's still just slightly under. So the fact that Roland's putting a 26 centimeter pivot length on this action uh, is actually pretty unique. So we've got this long pivot length, and that gives uh, a real sense of evenness from the front of the key to the back of the key. Um, you know, the black key doesn't feel any different to play at the front as it does to the back. And I bet if we got a set of weights out, we're going to see that there's a very low difference uh, in the pressure or the tension needed to activate those keys no matter where you are. And that's the whole advantage of having a long key, amongst others. Another thing, I had this piano teacher when I was in my teens who really worked on using the back as the main source of strength uh, for, you know, force in a key. Um, and when you were on a longer piano, it made a lot of sense why this was. Because sure, anybody can start two feet from a, a top of a key and really hammer it down and get the speed and the force. But then you hear, as a part of the tone, your hand slapping against the key. And it, and it really does create a very jarring percussive element that you don't necessarily want. So if you're starting on the key or just above the key and you've got a really long key, then the more force that you can put into that key on the longer lever is actually going to deliver a great deal of power, but you've got to be able to activate that with very, very little motion in your own hands. And so I know I'm kind of skidding off into like kind of a piano technique discussion, but again, the point is that having that long pivot length really allows you uh, to make use of some advanced piano technique that otherwise you wouldn't have any business doing on a digital piano. So we've got the length that's going to feel correct, but the ability to execute really high level repertoire on this instrument is also going to be at a very high level. It has a, a, an escapement, or sometimes it's called let off in there. The other thing it's got is it's got um, this uh, stabilizer pin, which is a vertical pin that sits right in the middle of the key near the back. Uh, now this has the same effect as uh, the balance rail pins on an acoustic piano. Yes, it's the point where it pivots, but it also provides a lot of, um, I guess, torsional stability. Uh, like the key is not going to rock from side to side, and it also completely removes that tension off of the hinge itself. So this is both a feel thing, but it's as much or more a durability thing. Um, and then on top of, or I guess to cap that all off, we have a triple sensor, which is going to um, lend itself well to more advanced repertoire because triple sensors are less likely to uh, you know, activate unintentionally when you're really uh, doing some fast or percussive uh, work. So all in all, what you've got is an instrument or an action that Roland intends to be in the hands of some very advanced piano players. The LX706 and 708 are the ones that have this action. Uh, and even the difference between it and the PHA50 uh, is pretty remarkable in terms of touch. Uh, now the top key surface on this is the same as what you're going to find on the PHA50. I believe it's even the same as what you get on uh, the PHA4, uh, which for the price, as anybody who knows, watch the channel, uh, I'm a big fan of that action for an instrument that you can get under a thousand bucks with with a PHA4. Uh, you've got the black keys that also have a very, very subtle texture uh, to it. Um, and Roland uh, on these instruments have also improved the cushioning underneath. So you don't get that, what used to be a pretty characteristic thump on the bottom of a Roland keystroke. This is now uh, much better, uh, yeah, much better cushioned. So that is our chat on the action. Be back for one very last brief section and conclusions. Thank you so much for being with us. See you in a second. So 
The 706, like the 708, is built to really mimic the size and the footprint of an upright piano, and they've put a lot of care into the design. In fact, I think the 708 even won a design award when it first came out, I think in 2019 or 2020. Uh, the 706 really isn't very far off, and you can now get the 706 in pretty well every finish that the 708 also comes in. So you can get this in a polished ebony, you can get it in this dark rosewood, you can get it in a charcoal, you can also get it in a light oak. Uh, Roland has put a tremendous focus on getting their cabinets right up to the very, very top uh, of the industry. And the cabinets are entirely done uh, in Malaysia where everything else uh, about the instruments is also manufactured. And anybody who knows um, Malaysia um, as an economy or as a country, uh, this is an incredibly advanced, prosperous uh, country at this point. Um, I know people who aren't familiar with the geography sometimes look at Malaysia and lump it in with Indonesia or even Vietnam. It really is in a, in a very different class in terms of its level of sophistication, advancement and integration as an economy. So these are where all of these instruments are coming out of. So there we have it. LX706, uh, like I said, when it first came out, feeling like it was a bit of an oddball that wasn't really gonna find an audience because of the relatively compressed difference in price between all three. Now that that's starting to expand, I think this is gonna find a whole new sweet spot in the coming 12 months that just wasn't there before. Um, and you're getting an instrument that's right at the beginning of its life cycle uh, in terms of its tone engine. This is going to have years of enjoyment behind it. Um, I find the action incredibly nice to play on. Uh, between the European Grand and the American Grand, I found the European Grand to be um, less of a unique tone but didn't require any tweaking out of the box. I found the American Grand, there were certain aspects of it that I think I was going to probably like more but would want to get in and tweak the settings just a little bit more tended to be a, a little too lively um, in a room that either had a wood floor or a larger space like we're in right here, uh, but I think held a tremendous amount of potential. Last but not least, this instrument is equipped with Bluetooth audio and Bluetooth MIDI as well as USB. Also comes uh, with headphone jacks, duh. Um, but it uh, has its own line out, so anybody who wants to have this uh, hooked up to a recording device uh, or their home stereo, you don't have to use the USB connection for it. You also have discrete quarter inch stereo outputs. Thank you so much for watching. My name is Stu Harris and this has been Miriam Pianos on YouTube. We do tons of these types of reviews all the time. It's great to be back in front of an instrument. Uh, we hope that you've enjoyed it. If you have, please comment, like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell uh, because we'd love to have you back watching more, participating in our community, uh, and hopefully, and most of all, Hope that you have uh, taken something away from this and uh, made your journey to your own piano a little bit easier and a little bit more enjoyable. We'll see you soon and thank you so much for watching.